The Raspberry Pi Pico is a powerful microcontroller, but most of the time we only use half of its processing power. Let me show you how to use the second core. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. I've been using the Raspberry Pi Pico in a few of my projects and it's very much taken over from the Arduino for me. Now the Pico is a powerful microcontroller board. So not only does it have 264 kilobytes of RAM and two megabytes of flash ROM, but it also has two ARM Cortex M0 Plus processor cores running at up to 133 megahertz. And indeed, you can actually overclock those up to over 200 megahertz. And this actually makes it actually orders of magnitude more powerful than your standard Arduino. Now, add to that the ability to use MicroPython for development, and the Pico becomes a fantastic platform for learning to build your own devices. Now, in this video, it's the dual core processor um, that I want to focus on. So with our normal projects, we end up running everything on just one single core, leaving half of the processing power of the Pico unused. Now, whilst not every bit of code can make use of two cores, uh, many can reap real benefits from parallel processing. And with MicroPython, running two threads is, is actually very easy, um, as long as you plan out what you're going to do. So let me show you how it's done. The basic idea of using two cores is actually quite simple. So if, if we can divide our code into two separate parts, we can then run each part on its own core. That the two halves can communicate with each other and synchronize actions. And, and, and MicroPython actually provides a special thread package to handle the division and running of our code on these separate cores. So um, one thing to note though, um, the thread package, so at the time of recording in April 22, um, this package was still in its early development stages uh, and it's sort of marked as experimental. Um, it does work, but there are a few issues and we'll be hitting a few of those and have to work around them in this tutorial. Um, so, so just to keep you up to date, the, the big issue that I found was that processing data on the second core seemed to generate a lot of temporary information that got left in the heap RAM space. Now, the, the garbage collection system wasn't able to clear this quickly enough, uh, and that led to system crashes. So um, explicitly running the garbage collection process as part of the code loop was the only workaround I could find. Um, and, and please do make sure you go through to the SPI LCD example later in this video to see exactly what happened and, and how I managed to get around that. Now, if you go to the MicroPython documentation, you'll find that it points you to the main CPython version of the package. Now, most of the features have been implemented and that will allow you low level control of the threads running on the two processor cores. So to use the thread package, we first need to import it into our Python file. Now, don't forget that all the code that I'm using in this tutorial will be available on a GitHub repository that I'll upload for you. Um, so do make sure you check out the links in the description below and also have a look at the main project page in my bitesandbit.co.uk website. And again, links for that in the description. Uh, and while you're here, don't, don't forget, please do subscribe to the channel to make sure that you get access to all of my upcoming videos on, on programming, uh, making and retro gaming. Back in the code then, we then need to create some sort of function which is actually going to be running the core one thread. And then we need to use the start new thread method from the thread package to create our new thread which will run on the second core, so core number one. 
This method will return us back a reference to the new thread, which we can use then to sort of control that and monitor what's going on. And the parameters then for the start new thread function are, first of all, we need to send it a reference to the function. And this needs to be a, an actual sort of normal Python function, or it could be a method in uh, an object or something. But that then is the reference to the function which contains the code which we want to run as our new thread on our second core. We then are able to supply a few parameters to that. So we have some the idea of p passing some positional parameters, and those need to be passed as a tuple. So you can see here I'm passing in two parameters for the first two positional parameters in my method. And then we have the ability then to pass in some keyword parameters as a dictionary as our third parameter in our method call. So this will end up then pro um, providing us then with two threads, one running on each of our cores. So this function here will run on core number one, and any code that we then have in the normal flow of our Python file will continue running then on core zero. Now the easiest way to see this working is to create a very simple threaded example. So in this example, we're going to create two threads. Our first thread, which we're going to be running on core number zero, is going to print even numbers out to the REPL console, and it's going to do that every second. So it's going to print out a number, go to the next one, and then wait for one second before continuing round in this infinite loop. Our second thread, which will run on core one, will be doing the same thing, but with um, odd numbers, and printing an odd number out every two seconds. So we have our, our one function here, which is going to be one of our threads, and a section function here, which is going to be our second thread. So down here, this is where we actually kick off our threads. So we use our thread.newStartThread thread method call to create this function running on our second core, so core number one. And again, we're gonna get back a reference to that so we can then do some things later if, if we did need to do that. Now, it's interesting to note then in the parameters then, of course, the parameters to start new thread, first of all, we have to give it a reference to the function which is going to form our the, the, the code for our thread. We then need to provide our parameter information. Now, this particular function doesn't require any parameters, but we do still need to include this second parameter in our method call. So we are using here an empty tuple, uh, and that is important. You, you, you do need to provide um, a tuple, even if it's empty, for this process to work. So at this point, we will kick off a, a new thread on core number one. And then down here, we, we're still now, this is in the main th um, uh, th uh, thread of our, of, of our Python, Python file. So we will now start this function running on our default core, which of course is core zero. So at the point when we get down to the end here, we will actually have two threads running, um, one on each of our cores. So let, let, let's load that up into our PyPico and see what happens. So if we start the code running in our REPL console, we'll see that we get our even and odd numbers now coming out with our even numbers coming out every one second and then our odd numbers coming out every two seconds. And you can see the two streams of numbers now intertwined in our console output. So, as you've seen, getting two threads to work in parallel is, is actually really easy. Where, where things start to get a bit more complicated though, is when the two threads need to talk to each other and share resources. Now, now talking to each other is fairly straightforward. Both threads share the same global namespace in your code. So if you define a variable outside of any function or class, it will then be available to both threads. So in this example, we're defining a run core one variable outside of any functions or classes. So that will make it a global variable and we can then make that available to any part of our code. So if we have a look at our two threads then, so we're going to have our core zero thread and this is going to really control the whole system.
So you can see it, it is importing our run core one global variable here. So that's making a reference back out to the global version. And this time again, we have our infinite loop here. And this is printing out five even numbers with one second um, sleep in between each. What it's then going to do is then going to set this global variable to true. And that's going to send a signal to core one to make core one start. We're then going to sit here um, waiting for core one to signal back that it is finished. And, and it's going to do that by setting this run core one variable back to false. And then of course we will go round again. So we're basically going to print out five even numbers, one second in between each. We're then going to ask core one to do its work. We're going to wait for core one to finish and then loop round again. If we look at our core one thread then, so again we're bringing in our global variable. We've got our infinite loop. So we start the loop by waiting for our true signal to come through from core zero. Once that happens, we're then going to print out three odd numbers with half a second in between each one. And then we're going to send a signal back to core zero that we have finished. And then we're going to loop back around again, waiting for our next run signal. So we can see here, our, both of our cores have got access to this global variable, and each one then is sending a message to the other core just simply by setting that variable to either true or false. Down the bottom, again, we have just a normal idea here where we're starting off our second thread on our core one and then relying on our default core then to run that core zero thread function. So let, let's upload this and see what happens. So if we start that running, we can see there we have our waiting signals and then our core zero doing its even numbers. Our core one then prints out its three odd numbers. And we see then we have both of our cores both sending signals to each other, then waiting for those signals coming back and then running their particular processes. Now, now we could of course wrap this flag up in a class so that we could easily share the data across code files. Um, as, as usual, global variables are never a great idea, especially if you're using multiple files as they tend to clutter up your code and can be very hard to maintain. In this example, we're creating a flag class which is going to replace our global variable. Inside that class, we're then creating a class level attribute. So defining a, a variable outside of any methods in the class, that makes it part of the class structure itself. And again, these then are shared across all instances of that class. So in effect, we're, we're creating a globally accessible variable. So as soon as, if, if we ever access our flag class, this common variable will be available to whatever part of code we're using. We're then creating a number of class level methods. So these methods then are accessing our class variable. So again, we don't need to ever actually instantiate a, a an instance of our flag class. All we have to do is access the flag class definition itself and then the class variables and methods within that. So we're setting one here for um, setting our run flag, for clearing our run flag down to false, and then also for reading the value of our, our run core one class attribute. So, so that then again, as I say, that, that's using the class, but at the class level, so that we in effect are mimicking our, our global variable, but now wrapping it up inside this nice package of, of our flag class. Inside our cores then, all we're doing is simply um, adjusting those so that they make use of this flag class instead of the global variable. So in our core zero thread, um, instead of setting the global variable, we're now setting the run flag inside our flag class. So again, you can see here, we're calling this as, as a um, class level, or, or if, if you're familiar with other languages, this is a, as a static method call. Um, and similarly down here, then we are reading back that flag through this um, second class method um, or, or the static um, function call. And again, core one doing exactly the same thing, um, reading the flag class member value and then setting it or, or clearing it down here.
And again, initially then we're setting the flag to zero and starting off our threads. So again, this, this function or that this code does exactly the same as the previous one but hopefully you can see here now that we have have neatly packaged our interprocess or interthread communications inside a neat little class uh, and that then of course we, we could extract this class out to a separate code file we could then of course extract each of our um, thread definitions out into separate code files and that would again make our our package the packaging of our code that much more um understandable it's especially once we we've, we've only got very very simple code here at the moment again once our code starts to spread out and, and become much more complex and then each of our th our thread code files may then of course be pulling in from different files this this means then that we have nicely in encapsulated our interprocess communication inside this nice little class so again this Again, this code here does exactly the same as before, but it is now a, a better formatted and better structured um, piece of software. Now, that, that's a very simple sharing using a flag-based systems, but, but sometimes we need to be very careful about who and when a thread can have access to some data or, or some resource. Uh, for, for example, um, the, the SPI interface, which we're going to be using later, now, if, if both threads try to use or update the same resource at the same time, we, we'll either get corrupted data or, or we could potentially crash part of our code. Now, there are a number of ways to achieve this control. And as we've seen, one is to use the simple flag mechanism above. And, and this will work for more basic, well-defined situations. But, but, but when you need to be a bit more flexible and have more control, um, we need to use something called a lock. Now, now a lock in our thread package, which is sometimes called a, a semaphore if you're into concurrent programming, this allows us to control access to, to really anything. We create a lock object and only the owner of the lock can use the resource. For example, Two threads need to use a single resource. If they access it at the same time, data will get corrupted. We create a lock, and each thread can only access the resource when it acquires control of this lock. So initially the lock is open. So the core zero thread is then able to acquire the lock and start interacting with the resource. The core one thread is now blocked from using the resource. It can request access, but we'll have to wait for the core zero to release the lock. So once core zero finishes, it releases the lock and puts it back into the unlock state. Now the core one thread is able to acquire the lock and start its processing. So that's the principle of the lock. Let's see a coded example. So here we have two threads which are continuously writing their messages out to the serial port. Uh, and that will come up, of course, on our console. So core zero is using uppercase and it's printing out a letter and then it's taking a little bit of delay and then printing out the next letter. So it's using uppercase for core zero and core one is doing exactly the same with lowercase for core one. Now, of course, the console can only output one stream of characters so if we run these without any locking or any control of who's writing when, we should get a mixed output. So if we run that, we'll see that we get our message coming out. And of course, we've got that complete mix of our capital, our lowercase and so on. So both, both of the threads are simply outputting their um, information to the console as soon as they want to. If we now rewrite our code using a lock, so down here, so in the main part of our Python file, so we're creating a global variable here, and that's just to make it a bit easier. We, we, we can, of course, then use um, objects and so on to, to hide these away. But I'm creating a global lock variable, and that's gonna be an instance of this thread.allocateLock method call. And of course, that's gonna return back one of these lock objects, which of course will initially be unlocked.
Now, the important thing to remember about locks are they don't actually lock any particular resource. They're simply a tool which you can use in your code to control the access to resources. Uh, and you have to then, as I say, write your code so that it obeys the lock principles and only accesses that resource when it has acquired control of the lock. And again, I'll say all that's down to you. So if we, if we have a look at our threads then, we can see that our, our core zero thread um, is exactly the same as before where we are simply writing out the string or, or the stream of characters. But now we are not starting our, our, our output until we have got hold of this lock. So we try this lock.acquire. And that method call then, if, if we don't supply any parameters to that method call, it does the standard wait for the um, acquisition. So if the lock is unlocked, then we will get hold of it. And this will come back and we, our code will continue. If the lock is currently being owned by somebody else, then this lock.acquire will go into a wait state and our, and our thread will actually pause at this line of code until it manages to get hold of the lock. So in effect, we will have a pause here. And then, so, so this lock then, this, this thread waits to see if it can get hold of the lock. Once it gets hold of the lock, it will then have sole use of our console and should be able to output its message all in one go. The important thing then, of course, is once you have finished your task, you need to release the lock and that lets other threads then get hold of it and continue in their process. And of course, our, our thread one is doing exactly the same thing. So it's importing the lock, the global lock variable. And again, it starts its loop by trying to get hold of it. So, so once our code first starts, one of these threads will acquire the lock. The other thread will try to acquire it, but go into a wait state. Once the thread which got hold of the lock completes its process and releases it, then immediately the thread that was waiting for the lock to become available will get hold of it and continue on its process. And you can see there that each one will then get hold of the lock, process its um, message, release the lock and let the other one in. And in this way, you can see that we are now getting full control of our stream output to our console. And each thread should be able to complete its message in one go without any interruptions. So let, let's try that then in our, on our Pico. So starting our code, we can see there that core zero has got the lock, then core one, then core zero, and so on. But now we've got that nice um, steady message completion per thread run. And again, they're taking it nicely in turns because as, as one thread gets hold of the lock, the other then is in the waiting state and the rule then is as soon as the lock is released, whoever is currently waiting will then get hold of the lock and, and so on. And they're passing control backwards and forwards. So the basic lock acquire method um, that we've just used means that one of your threads will simply go into a waiting state until it gets hold of the lock. Now, this might not be what you want it to do. For, for example, you, you might be collecting some data and want to use the serial channel to send it um, to some um, data collection system. Now, if you can't use the channel, you still need to carry on gathering that data. And, and you can simply try then to regain the lock at a later time. So in this example, we're going to set the core zero thread to continuously pull the lock to see if it's available. If it's not available, instead of just waiting, it will continue processing by counting how many times it has pulled the lock before it finally gets ownership. So here we're using the acquire method and that actually takes two positional parameters. So the first is a Boolean wait flag. And if you set that to zero, that means then that the, pr the thread is not going to wait for the lock to be available. It will check whether it is available or not, but then just carry on. Um, setting it to one, of course, then means that it will wait. The, the second parameter then is a timeout value. So if you have 
told the thread to wait for the lock to become available. This sets the amount of time in seconds that it's going to wait before it gives up and just returns back with a false saying that I did not manage to get the lock. So if we run this version, um, we'll see that pr previously um, when we used the two um, cores both using the waiting method call, they were taking it in nice turns. So one would get a go and then the other would get a go when that um, lock has been released. But, but now, uh, when core zero tries to get control, it, it does check to see if the lock is available. But instead of waiting, it now goes off and does some other processing before it comes back to pull the lock again at a later time. On the other hand, core one uses the wait method. So as soon as it tries to acquire the lock, it goes into this waiting state and then is primed to take control as soon as that lock is available. So as soon as core one releases its lock at the end of its loop, it will immediately go back and try to reacquire it again. So, so that you can hopefully then see that at some times core one is able to complete its loop, release the lock, and then get back to the reacquire the lock code while core zero is still off updating its poll counter. So this means that core one will tend to get more than its fair share of the use of the, of the console. So it's important that you do bear this in mind when, when you're running multiple threads, that, that you need to make sure that one thread isn't going to be greedy when it comes to taking control of resources. So that's the basics of concurrent coding using the thread package in MicroPython. So the um, best thing to do now is to actually see it in a real world example. So this code is a development of my SPI LCD panel display driver. Now I'll be covering the multi-core version in more detail in a separate tutorial, but I want to use it as an example here to show how software can be broken up and the issues you might come across when using multiple cores. So core zero, which is the default core in our MicroPython code, um, it updates the models in our code and then starts the rendering process. And this is going to draw objects onto the frame buffer memory space. So once this process finishes, uh, we need the SPI handling process to start drawing that frame out to the LCD panel. Now this frame buffer memory object it is the actual resource that we need to control access to. Only one process can use it at any one time, otherwise we're going to end up having half-drawn frames getting sent out to our LCD panel. Core 1 runs the SPI handler code, and that initially sits waiting for access to the frame buffer lock. So once it has that access, it assumes a frame has been prepared and the memory buffer needs to be sent to the LCD panel. So once it acquires the lock controlling the buffer, it sends the frame buffer to the LCD panel and then when it's finished, it releases that lock to allow the render thread process access again. In our core zero thread, the update model code can actually be run in parallel with the SPI handler. So only the code where it renders objects onto the frame buffer memory needs to be controlled so that we don't have a clash with the other thread. So this means that our code is able to use the slow SPI transfer time to complete the majority of our model processing, which of course then increases our frame rate, keeping our SPI channel working as hard as possible. Now in, back in our core zero thread then, um, our code has to pause at the start of the rendering process to wait for the frame lock to be reacquired, and then we can draw the objects into the buffer. When it finishes, it releases the lock, and that of course then lets the SPI handler on core one have control of the memory map, and we then start going around in our uh, rendering loop. If we run this code on the Pi Pico, we do get an odd output. Uh, the boxes seem to run, but then they freeze. Now this did take me a while to work out what was wrong, but it seems to be a sort of memory leak in the threading system. Uh, as, as the new thread is processing, it, it must be writing temporary data to the system heap RAM uh, for local variables and etc. And, and this doesn't seem to get cleaned fast enough by the garbage collection process.
So to get it to work, I needed to add an explicit garbage collection call at the end of the SPI handler loop. So we have to import the garbage, uh, the garbage collection uh, library at the top of our code and then run a garbage collection um, at the end of our SPI loop. Um, so, so again, the thread package is an experimental package um, as it does state in the documentation. Um, so I guess this is one of the areas where they're still ironing out a few bugs. So with the garbage collection in place, everything does seem to run fine. But if we examine the code in a bit more detail, we'll see that there are some situations where we could either miss or duplicate frames. And, and this is because there are two code races in our code. Uh, so, so when our render code finishes, it releases the lock uh, that we're using to control access to the buffer memory. It then loops back into the update model code. Uh, and once that's finished, then it, it tries again to acquire the lock for the next frame render. Now, this code assumes that the SPI handler thread will take control of the lock before the main thread has finished the update process. So if, if it doesn't, the main thread will simply be able to reacquire the lock and process the next frame before one has been sent out to the SPI handler. And this, of course, will cause a frame to be skipped. Now, th th this situation is actually overcome by the way in which our code is organized, um, where the SPI handler releases its lock on the frame lock immediately and then loops round and tries to reacquire the lock. Um, using the waiting technique. So, so basically, uh, as soon as the render thread releases the lock, the SPI thread will then be sitting there waiting to take control of it. And as we've seen before, a, a waiting thread will get access immediately. However, it, it, this does of course show that there is a second race condition in these loops. So when the SPI thread acquires the lock and starts sending data to the LCD panel, the main thread at that point starts to process the model updates. Now, if the model update process takes a long time, the SPI thread will finish, release its lock on the frame buffer, and then go back and try to reacquire it. Now, usually, and what we're relying on here is that the render thread um, where we're actually um, drawing the objects onto our frame buffer should be sitting waiting ready to take control when the SPI thread finishes. But if the model updates haven't finished, then the lock will still be available for the SPI thread. The, the, up, the render process will not have got round trying to reacquire it and therefore waiting for it. So the SPI thread now will be able to simply reacquire the lock and of course that will mean it will just resend the last frame out that, uh, that it, it, it sent to the LCD and that will give us a duplicated frame and, and that creates a delay um, where we're now having to resend the same frame a second time and that has to complete before the next new frame can be sent out. So here, um, the issue here then, of course, is that neither thread knows what the other thread is doing. So um, there are a number of ways of getting around this, um, and, and we could um, do that by using some flags to show the different thread states so that each can see what the other one is doing. Or another method, which I, I'm going to implement now, is that we can create more control um, in the way in which we use our threads and we can rethink how our parallel processing uh, might also be reorganized to remove uh, our need for these flags. And as we'll see, it will also remove our need for this explicit garbage collection. So, so far, all of our threads have run as infinite loops. So, so they're always active and they're always running in parallel. Uh, but this doesn't have to be the case. We, we can actually start, stop and restart threads whenever we want. So a thread will exit if you perform a return from the function that controls the thread code. And you can then restart it using the normal start new thread method call. So in, in this version of our code, 
we initially only have a single thread running on our main core. So when our core zero thread finishes drawing a frame into the buffer memory, it actually then starts the SPI handler code running on the second core. It also sets a global flag variable so that it knows that it has asked that SPI frame to be rendered out to the LCD panel. The SPI render thread can now start sending the frame data to the LCD panel immediately, as, as it only ever starts once the frame buffer is free for use. So, so we've also removed the need for this um, lock object. Now, once the SPI handler has finished um, this, this LCD transfer, it then resets this rendering flag, and that lets the main thread know that the LCD panel has been refreshed. Uh, and then that th our SPI handler thread simply exits by, by getting to the end of its code, or, or we could issue a return value at that point. So the thing here is that when our thread exits, it, it does seem to automatically clear up any heap data it's left behind, and it effectively cleans itself out of the Pico memory, so that it's ready then for its next run request. So, this gives us our finished solution. And as you can see, we get a nice um, working display then on our LCD panel. So that's multi-threading on the Raspberry Pi Pico. And hopefully I've given you enough information to use this very powerful technique in your own projects. And as we've seen, starting processes on the second core is, is not really that difficult in MicroPython. And with a little bit of thought, we can make sure that our processes play nicely together and can communicate and share data and resources. So if you've enjoyed this tutorial and found it useful, please do make sure that you like the video and subscribe to my channel for more making, coding and gaming episodes. Have fun coding your Raspberry Pi Pico, and I'll see you again soon. So, bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects, and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and visit my website.